All right, what's going on, everybody? Welcome into another episode of the Buffalo Beat. My name is Joe Viscalia. Thanks to all of you for being incredibly patient with me as I was on vacation for a few weeks there. Uh, just getting some downtime before training camp got going, but uh, we are back already three practices deep into uh, into the Buffalo Bills 2022 campaign, and we've got a lot to talk about. So I didn't want to do it alone, um, as our guy Matthew Fairburn is uh, in transit to moving back to Buffalo. Um, we, uh, we called in a substitute, and uh, what better way to do it than to just, you know, keep this whole Matt streak going. You know, we had Matt Fairburn, we had Matt Beauvais last season, so let's bring in a guy who's making his first or his debut on the Buffalo Beat, Matt Perino, who covers the Bills for uh, for Syracuse.com, New York Upstate.com. Matty P, welcome to the Buffalo Beat, dude. The, I, I must say I feel honored. Uh, I'm tingling. And also, I don't know if there, you could find yourself being any more comfortable than I am following Matt Fairburn. I've done it before at Syracuse.com <laughs> since he was in my role before I did that. So uh, it's awesome to have him back in town. It is awesome to have you two back together. I am a uh, card-carrying member of the Buffalo Beat fan club. So I listen often, so it's very cool to be on the show. Uh, I'm glad that you guys are back together. Yeah, we um, it it's it's good because you know we, we've I've come on your show a few times, and it's always a it's always a good conversation, and and especially for the start of camp, you just want to you know go over some of the some of the big stuff, and maybe some of the the minor stuff because I know you you pay close attention just like I do. Um, but I think I wanted to start first and foremost just the. The thing that's kind of been hovering over the Bills throughout the entirety of the offseason, and it's it's dissipated a little bit since day one, but I I find the the Jordan Poyer conversation to have taken a, a legitimate shift from where we were in the offseason, like wondering, hey, is this gonna happen? Are the Bills really gonna play ball? To to now thinking that it might only be a matter of when, not if, because we we saw that Drew Rosenhaus was there the first day. We saw that um, that uh, you know Poyer admitting that uh, the two sides would be talking, and you know basically that's why Rosenhaus was there. And really, Brandon Bean giving the strongest sign of intent yet by saying, you know, I see both those guys playing well for the foreseeable future. Um, those are three pretty big indicators of interest, and uh, I wonder if you kind of came away with with the with the same viewpoint of that and. You know, it, it just seems like Poyer's practicing in full. There hasn't been, like, any intimation of him taking plays off, even the mandatory minicamp. Like, he, he he was full in. So it just seems like the Bills have kind of made their decision, and now it's trying to find the, the right um, formula to, to get to that deal. My sense is that Jordan Poyer's placing all of his faith in Sean McDermott because, you know, obviously it's Brandon Bean who does the contracts, but I think it's Sean McDermott and Bean, obviously, as a, as a group that have built the foundation of what this is. And Jordan Poyer was one of the first pieces. And so when I think that you go back to the Micah Hyde charity softball game and Sean McDermott comes out of that and talks about the great conversation that they had, I think that there is a trust between those two people that, you know, Poyer for, you know, in his own view, feels the team is going to do right by him, right? Now, what does that look like? Does that look like a big extension? I don't know if that necessarily makes sense for either side because if they do find an extension, what is the Brandon Bean way? It's getting a guy an, more money but something that fits into what they do. I think it's going to be something that is going to be interesting with Dawson Knox and Ed Oliver, Tremaine Edmonds as well. But most of the contracts he's done recently, Matt Milano, Josh Allen, Tredavious White, on the other side of those deals, you go back and look, and it's like, man, those guys kind of took a discount to stay here. Mm -hmm. Jordan Poyer feels like he's at a point of his career where he wants one more big payday. And how I see that happening is, all right, Drew Rosenhaus and, and Jordan Poyer come together and they say, let's, or, or, and Brandon Bean come together and say, let's get one year, let's get him up to where we, he feels he deserves to be paid whether that's 13, 14, 15 million, whatever it works out to be, give him a lot of that money up front, add a void year, and then you let Jordan Poyer hit free agency. Maybe he can get that payday. Maybe he does at that point want to take a discount to come back. I just, I'm, 
even though Brandon Bean said that he he, he sees them playing well in their in, in for the foreseeable future, what does a three or four year extension look like? When can they get out of it? Are they going to have to redo it again, or is the salary cap going to be in a situation that's good enough that allows them to maybe get out of it in the future? Because look at Matt Milano's deal right now. Mm-hmm. I don't think they can really get out of that after they restructured it. Yeah, yeah, th- these are good points. I mean, I think the thing where where I land because I was of the same viewpoint as you um, uh, on the Poyer deal uh, before we got to camp where it's like, okay, maybe they just, you know, give him, get him up to speed this year, make him happy and then let him hit free agency. But that, that foreseeable future comment has just stuck with me with, with Bean. And he just, he just doesn't say stuff like that. If, if he, if he doesn't mean it. And, I wonder if maybe this is a, a chance for them to try and pair the contract with with Poyer and Hyde. Now, it might wind up becoming that they have to make a decision on one of those guys after the 2023. Like, let's say they sign Poyer to a one-year extension. Just get him going and, and then add void years at, at the back half of that so that way they can – you know, get him the money that he wants this year. The next year's cap hit wouldn't be that bad. And then you just have additional money in uh, 24 and 25 attributed to him. But I think to your point with the, with the McDermott and uh, the McDermott point that those were the first two guys really he brought in and Patrick DeMarco, which <laughs> he's not here anymore, <laughs> but, uh, but having those guys in the crucial point of this entire build I think might make it a little bit more conducive to getting them signed through 2023 and then figuring it out from there because they're going to have to figure out so much <laughs> at that point because you know the majority of their roster is going to be pretty old at, at that like everyone thinks of them as a young team but they're they're getting like time doesn't stop like right. Milano's going to be 30 by that point um Dawkins is going to be near the end of his deal which is crazy to think about because you feel like you just he just signed it um and and then you've got Hyde and Poyer who will be in their age 33 season uh the offense like Morse will be done like they're gonna have some legitimate turnover in the next few years here so I wonder if maybe they just like all right we'll we'll get to that when we get to that and just go full board of this year I think those again all great points the, the one thing that I would kind of ask you for your take on, because it's something that I've struggled with and why I'm, I can't find a way that they get this done to Poyer's liking on a long-term extension. I don't think he wants another two-year deal. I think he wants like 25, 30 guaranteed. Oh God, no way. There, there's no, there's no way he's getting that from, from here. But I think that's why he spent the money on Drew Rosenhaus. And so if that's their, if that's their line and they want to work. They want to play ball because he wants to win a Super Bowl. How is the best way to do that? And that's probably with a one-year deal that gets him his money up. And and then it motivates him to come back and do that all pro year all over again this year and see if he can't, you know, sign the big contract in free agency. I don't know what that looks like. If I'm Drew Rosenhaus and I take Jordan Poyer on as a client, I think I can work with the Bills, right? Maybe I can get an extension. But I also probably think if that doesn't work out, I can get him a deal on the other side in free agency after this year that must have been one of the selling points that's just what i've been coming back to because i do know he feels underpaid when it comes to the group with that that money that like up front and i think that that's what he's they're probably fishing for yeah it's it's weird because like if if he's i know he wanted to make his age a big a big thing at the press conference like oh i've been i've been hearing everybody talk about my age but 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 it's real like you're 31 the the Odds are that you decline in the next two to three years are pretty high. Like that's that's just life in the NFL. And if it doesn't, then then good on you. But to award a guy twenty to thirty mil guaranteed in his age thirty one is bad business. Mm-hmm. And so if if that's really what they're looking for, then mm, I, that's that's probably a, a a no for me, dog. But when you if they were able to somehow convince him to be like look got a two-year window here where feel pretty good have a lot of deals uh going through this you have micah here to try to appeal to his sentimentality more, more than anything because you know he could have 
absolutely turned his back on mandatory minicamp. But something is preventing him from, you know, fully committing to, like, whether it be the, the uh, what, what's, what's the word for it? The hold in that, that T.J. Watt did forever ago. It's, it's a compelling piece to the puzzle. I just, if they were able to do the one-year deal, I think that's the thing that's smartest for all sides. I think the Bills would probably want a two-year deal. Poyer and Rosenhaus probably want a three- to four-year deal. But in what world does that make sense for, for a guy that age? So it's it's definitely a convoluted issue that um, we still don't have a, a resolution on. Um, it's now the 26th, and you know I'm sure these, these two sides are going to continue to talk. But it's just... It it felt like it was closer to being resolved a few days ago um, than it has at, at any point. And, but I guess we just don't know what that resolution looks like. I also think it's kind of interesting that they've been so gung-ho, even with Poyer back now, even going back to mandatory minicamp, of running Jaquan Johnson in with both mm-hmm. Hyde and Poyer. I think they're at the point now where they're like, all right, we, we are going to need a succession plan at some point, whether it be for somebody leaving or whether it be somebody getting hurt. Like if you lose Hyde or Poyer for the year, I don't care how much you're you're high on Jaquan Johnson or DeMar Hamlin. You're not, you're not probably penciling him in there, putting him in pen and thinking they're going to give you the same production, at least not right now. It's possible. Um, look where Jordan Poyer was when they, when, when they started with him uh, and Micah Hyde years ago. But I think the, the way that this defense looks this year and what we've seen from this defensive line in camp this week, and I know the pads aren't on yet, so let's all like take a step back and relax a little bit. I don't necessarily know if they're going to need the same kind of production from their secondary that they've needed in the past just on its own because I think they're going to really get some help from up front. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that that is that's the goal because – you know, it we might wind up seeing seeing it flip a little bit in the next few years here, because you know Tre'Davious White it has always been a great player for them, but you know how I mentioned that people are getting up there in age, like Trey's getting up there in age at, at this point. Um, let's see, what's it? What is he? Twenty eight, going on twenty nine, I, I think. Um, then you have Elam, who's a rookie. You don't know what he's going to turn into. Taron Johnson's been in the league for for a substantial amount of time now. Um, Hyde and Poyer are both in their 30s. Uh, what is he? 27. 27, turning 28 soon. Um, so as you kind of go, these these things kind of flip for you, where maybe you're depending less on your your coverage and more on more on the the guys up front, which you can't always have have everything like they, they've always struggled to do one thing or the other. And I think from what they were last year where they, you know, failed to bring the quarterback down this year, like it, it, they might fail to keep guys from from popping open too early um, because of Elam and being a rookie. Dane Jackson being just kind of up and down like like he has been throughout his career and then Tredavious White just coming back from the torn ACL. So, yeah, it 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 feels like it feels like this year is kind of an interest a low key interesting one for the defense, but you know, th- that Poyer piece is is one certainty and the Jaquan Johnson points a good one. He's someone they have always liked, but he's also on an expiring too. So, <laughs> maybe they're thinking, okay, Poyer Get, bring him in for one year, sign Jaquan Johnson for cheap um, over a, a two to three year deal. Maybe see what you have in him and and then have him battle Tamar Hamlin for, for a starting job next year. But it, there's no easy answer. It's the, the Poyer thing is just continuing to, to hover over over this team until there's a resolution. And it hasn't been a huge issue because he's practicing. But if this goes into the season and, and there's no resolution, then like, is he going to be pissed off um, the, the whole year? Like, it's, it's, it's just an interesting thing. I don't think that's going to be a problem only because he had to have kind of been pissed off last year, right? Yeah, that's fair. Like, the whole Cole Beasley thing, the, the all the vaccination stuff. He never made a peep about it. He didn't make it. You know, he didn't really want to talk about it in the press. But we know the situation off the field and the stance in his household and with his wife. And he didn't make it a big deal. So I don't think that he's going to be somebody that – even if he's frustrated individually, he's always going to put the team over that. Let me ask you a question. Yeah. Who's more important to this defense? 
this year and in the next two years? Poyer or Tremaine Edmonds? Edmonds. Yeah, probably Edmonds for me just because of the – and again, Poyer doesn't like the whole age thing being thrown out. But, I mean, Micah High made the point today. Tremaine Edmonds – will be in year 10 and he'll still be 29. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, and that's, Younger than Poyer now. <laughs> right. That's that's five years. That's a good five years from now. I mean, um, Edmonds to me, and I know he's kind of a, a lightning rod for, for everybody. Um, it, you know, you're either one side or the other on him. There's not really much in between. He, he is a, a really good linebacker in the NFL. And I'm curious to know what his price tag would ultimately be especially because like he's got a he's got a strong reputation w within the Bills front office. Yes. But like the fact that he hasn't made those those game-changing plays that at everyone is talking about, that's also being seen across the rest of the league. So I wonder if that value of his kind of drives down just a little bit from that perspective. Like yes, he has the Pro Bowls. Do people really give a crap about Pro Bowls around the NFL? Probably not in terms of negotiation. So I wonder what his ultimate value would would be and if by the end of it if you're able to get him signed to a long term if that ends up looking like a like a pretty good deal and the other complicating factor here is that Matt Milano's getting kind of up there in age and and his contract's weird um, Milano this year is 27 well, actually he's turning 28 in two days mm -hmm. um, so and he's someone that has always carried the injury risk more so than others, right? Mm -hmm. It's It has been a lot of soft tissue stuff. He's a very built-up guy. And sometimes those guys who are, like, maxed out will be more susceptible to these soft tissue stuff. And we, we've seen that from time to time. It, I mean, it hasn't been a huge issue for him the last couple of years. But, you know, as he's getting more miles on the tires and, and getting up there in age – you know, these things start to happen more and more. So uh, that's why I think Tremaine is pretty important to them moving forward, just because of the, they're going to have so much change in the next two to three years. But Tremaine to me is, is one that could, could be a staple for a long time. And I think they probably look at it the same way. It just depends on cost. I think because of what they've done up front, nobody's going to benefit more from that than Tremaine. Yeah. So, I think you're in a situation, and the reason I ask that just because you might get to a point where you gotta you gotta make that choice between two players. You look at who they have to pay coming up here in um, Ed Oliver, who's a ten or fifteen sack season away from just absolute mega bucks, and then Dawson Knox, who you know if he if he replicates what he did a year ago and, and has close to ten touchdowns this season, you know that's another guy that's gonna be making probably north of ten million per season. And so you have just a lot of money. You know, I do think the Tremaine Edmonds conversation is interesting because if you look at his, I think the um, franchise number, franchise tag number for linebackers is going to be around 13 million. Mm -hmm. And so, and if you think he would get a little bit more than that on the open market, that's when you really start thinking, man, can you afford that? And if Poyer wants like 14 at its safety, you're just going to have to – my point is you're just going to have to cut this off at some point and rely on who you drafted. Mm -hmm. um, I think that Terrell Bernard is a really – I'm really in, interested to see the versatility of his game once the game start. Like we've seen a little bit in camp without pads, but I want to see like kind of where he plays long term because I know he's undersized, but I think in a lot of ways that those two roles, like the, what Milano and Tremaine do – and you're more of the film guy than I am, but I think they're a little bit more interchangeable sometimes than we even think. And I'm wondering, could Milano play that middle linebacker role? Just an, a thought. I don't know if necessarily this is the way. Mm -hmm. And then Bernard slot into that weak side role with what Taron Johnson done as well. I don't know. Just a, just a thought. Yeah, I, I I hear where you're coming from there with there. Matt Milano. I mean, some of the beauty of his game is that he is extremely good at um, at coming from from the outside and you know when when he's clean off blocks and being able to, to weave through i mean i think the thing that that people take issue with with tremaine is that um sometimes his block shedding is, isn't the best but he also has the length 
the height, the, the, the weight to be able to sustain that a lot better than a Milano or, or, or a Terrell Bernard would. So I think he is valuable in that respect because him tying up, you know, blockers frees up Poyer, frees up Hyde, frees up Taron Johnson, frees up Milano. Like he, he plays a, a very important team based role that because he's not making these huge individual leaps that, uh, that often go kind of overlooked. Um, I do think they do need some degree of size at linebacker. And I think that's why Edmonds kind of gives them the best of both worlds because he's still like super athletic. Mm -hmm. Um, He's as fluid as, as uh, a lot of linebackers in the league. Like, like he's for his size, he probably has, you know, if you're doing it in terms of like size to fluidity ratio, probably one of the best in the league because of how big he is. Um, and and just how well he moves and how he's able to stick with everybody and then the long arms to be able to uh, to take down um, passing angles and zone coverage and everything like that like he's a headache for quarterbacks so I, I don't know that because Milano very short armed smaller guy former safety uh, at BC it, it's an inexact fit not saying that it wouldn't work but I think there are a few things working ag- against it to the point where, you know, maybe, maybe you're just better off keeping Tremaine and then figuring out what to do with Milano when you are able to get out of his deal after the 2023 season and save like seven and a half million dollars. So there there's different ways to go about it, but we're talking about a lot of future stuff. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we need, we need to get in to camp because I think, and this is all interesting future stuff because, you know, it's obviously the conversation that the bills need to be having with themselves, but camp in itself, you know, like you pointed out, we're three days in. We're we're recording this at the night of the twenty sixth after after day three has happened. No pads have gone on. No physicality. No shells either. No shells. Like this is this has basically been extended OTAs and mandatory minicamp. So, I ask you, um, what has or who has stood out the most to you in training camp so far, either for good or bad? Well, I told myself over and over again, over again, the two weeks leading up to the start of camp that I was not going to kickstart the hype train on James Cook until <laughs> sat- until Saturday or whenever the pads were going to come on. But I think I'm starting to cut in my own head, starting to do it because I, I think that a what how I think they view him, it combined. I think he's got more opportunities than I thought he was going to, you know, and that. I'm not going too deep into the, like what team he's playing on and all that, but just across the board, the way that the how they're how they're choosing right now to get the ball in his hands, you start to envision what this is going to look like with pads on or in the game. We saw today. I mean, there's two like eye popping plays, and again, it doesn't matter. You can, you're not getting hit, so it's completely different. But the fluidity to his game, the way that he moves, I feel like he gets up to top speed quickly and he maintains it really well. He's very shifty. And you know he's he can play with a little bit of physicality, and I think, I think he was a little bit underrated in the draft process just because of the role that he played at Georgia. And I think this regime is really good at finding a specific skill set, like zeroing in on it and finding a way to implement it in their offense. Now the problem is going to be, I think, learning to run like before you know how to walk with Ken Dorsey mm-hmm. as the offensive coordinator because. There's going to be so much on his plate. Brian Dable, even in year three and year four, implementing new weapons. Sometimes it took a little bit of time. I'm wondering if Ken Dorsey is going to be able to really fully utilize him right out of the gate or if he's going to just be more you know, focused on leaning on what they do really well. I almost feel like James James Cook in this offense is a luxury, but it's a luxury that could, be, that could really pay off because I think he's going to put defenses in a bind with his speed. Yeah, it's something that they haven't had. Um for sure, out of the running back spot. Uh, he, and today he had um, four receptions on five opportunities. The fifth one, he kind of short-armed it a little bit. Um, but, you know. What, what was your phrase for that? Uh, T-Rexed it. Yep. Right. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, he – but they were definitely looking for him. And most of – actually, I think all of his targets today came from Case Keenum. Okay. Um, actually, maybe one of them did not. No, it was the one that he short-armed. Uh, that, that came from Josh Allen. But the other four came from Case Keenum, and those were all catches. 
I think Cook is a is a solid player to add to this offense. Do I think he has an incredible ceiling as kind of a do it all back this year? No. Um, I think Devin Singletary is definitely in the conversation, and quite honestly, I think Zach Moss is is in the conversation more than people are willing to admit. And even in in the first couple of days, we saw Moss. Um, when when fans were in attendance, we saw Moss, Singletary, and and Cook all kind of roll through and and work with Josh Allen. And it's not just a, hey Zach, we drafted you, and so so here's a few reps with with QB one. I think they're they still believe that there's talent there. So the Cook conversation is also comes down to opportunity. Like how are they going to get him those opportunities? Who's going to be on the field the most often? Devin Singletary, of course, free agent at the end of the year, and, and that has to be considered. Zach Moss is signed through the next two years. Um, are they going to use more two running back sets this year? Uh, because they really didn't do that much at all last season. Because, you know, why would you put Zach Moss and Devin Singletary on the field at the same time? But to me, like, there, there is a definitive chance that unless, you know, Zach Moss just – completely defecates on himself like he did last year um i think there's a chance that that he can have a really legitimate role because let's not forget he is still someone that was their best runner at the end of the 2020 season um and then suffered the injury in the playoffs and last year after he had gotten um healthy scratched in the new orleans game came back and had limited opportunities but when he got those opportunities like he was doing well with them. So they're not they're not done with Zach Moss. It's not to say he's gonna be some fantasy darling or anything like that, but it, it would just complicate things even more. And I know a lot of people are wondering really high on James Cook from a fantasy perspective. And it's I'm sure you get it just as much as I do. One of the biggest questions, like, okay, how big is James Cook's role going to be this year? And the question and the answer is, I don't know. I don't know if any three of these guys are gonna be fantasy usable, but Cook at least from an on-field perspective, gives them something that they don't have as a pass catcher. I wonder if it's just going to be a flat J.D. McKissick role, honestly. Like, McKissick, passing down specialist, maybe sometimes you work in two backs, because I know Washington sometimes, they throw McKissick out wide, and they'll have uh, Antonio Gibson in the backfield. They didn't do it a ton, a ton, but I wonder if that's just the vision. And there's also the small point of me that thinks... If they missed out on James Cook, I think they would have felt okay because they traded down when when he was still on the board because like, eh, you know, we've, we've got like three guys that, that mm-hmm. we still like on the clock. So it's not like they were intently targeting this guy. They probably saw he was, they probably thought he was more of a third round value and just wanted to move back and, and get some get some additional value out of their pick. But that's that's something that's always kind of kicked around in the, in the back of my brain. But he's definitely got something that that they haven't had. But he's I just don't know that he's going to be the full package that they're looking for. You know, could be wrong. But uh, but great, great route runner, great pass catcher. Is he going to be able to run between the tackles that they want him to? Um, that remains to be seen. This podcast is brought to you by Roman. Go to GetRoman.com slash beat today. And if approved, you'll get $10 off your first order. You know how when you're wearing a great outfit, everything just looks right, your confidence is soaring, you can walk into a room knowing you're on your A-game. But if you've been struggling with PE, Roman can give you that same feeling in the bedroom. Guys, man-to-man, we care about each one of you. We want you to feel confident. We want you to prioritize your health and your relationships. So if you're ready to do that, start with Roman. Roman swipes are clinically proven to help you last longer in bed. No prescription needed. PE treatments are safe, effective, and used by millions of men. And Buffalo Beat listeners get free two-day shipping. So go to GetRoman.com slash Beat today. They have approved. Get $10 off your first order. That's GetRoman.com slash Beat. I think Zach Moss being written off by, you know, a portion of of Bills fans is, is interesting, only from the sense that you're not doing – what we were talking about earlier in this podcast and like thinking down the line, Mm -hmm. like Devin Singletary is coming into a year where, you know, if the right team likes him, they're probably going to, they're probably going to give him a multi-year deal worth, you know, 
five, six million, maybe even that maybe that's the ceiling of what a contract could look like for him. I don't think the Bills are matching that, especially with just with how they roll running backs anyway. They've now spent a draft pick, uh, and now uh or three day two draft picks in the last in the last four drafts, they've done it three times. So they're very comfortable with doing this on a yearly basis. And I think it's actually a really smart draft um process because you don't want to get in a situation like some of these other teams where you have to break off a running back. And I don't think that it's really this this uh, this team's ever going to be predicated on that. And the the moves they made in the offseason to upgrade the run blocking on their offensive line. Like look at the, some of the players that they brought in. You know, um David Questenberry, Roger Saffold, uh Greg Van Roten even. You know, Cody Ford was actually even drafted. Go ahead. OJ Howard. OJ Howard. Cody Ford, you remember the draft process. That was the like the top notch on his profile was he's going to be a road grader in the run game. It hasn't really worked out that way. But I also think that he has a chance to work with a guy that maybe can unlock that part of his game. I don't know if he's going to be on the field to do it. He's probably going to be a depth player. But mm-hmm. they brought in a lot of players that give them options in the run game. And, you know, we saw it even today. Like Mitch Morse out in space in front of Devin Singletary, just clearing the row. That's where he's the best. If they're going to continue to, to utilize their guys that way in the run game, I, I think any one of these three can have a good game on any on, on any day. And I'm as high on Zach Moss right now as I've been since they drafted him. Yeah, he, he's – he's. I mean, we're not making this a Zach Moss pod, even though I've been jokingly calling him RB1 all day at practice just, <laughs> just to mess with Perino and, and like, Elena Getzenberg and – Catherine Fitzgerald, uh, and even Matt Bovey to a small degree, but but I mean he's got he's got a legit opportunity to to carve out a nice role here. So I, he's the the whole running aspect to it. I think they want to run more play action this year. I think I think uh, they want to implement more of his own blocking scheme, and that's a lot of the the moves that they've made in in the off season with with these offensive linemen getting more athletic, and and you know I think we've we've. Uh, we saw a little bit of of them having success doing things like that at the end of last year, like the pin and pull stuff that that you you reference with Mitch Morse. Like he's awesome when when he's getting out in front of people and just just bearing down on people. And when you add more athletic pieces, Spencer Spencer Brown is a super athlete. He needs to kind of pick it up from what he was at the end of last year. But you know, Ryan Bates is super athletic. Deion Dawkins is a good athlete. Uh, Roger Saffold is a is a pretty good athlete, even though he's up there in age. Um, so these are all elements that will help the run game. And it also makes me wonder maybe if they run it a little bit more this year, not like crazy amount, but just, just, just a little bit more. All right. Um, let's, let me, let me think of, a another, Oh, the, on the defensive side, the, the one guy that has stood out to me so far out of nowhere, you know, kind of along the same lines as Zach Moss here, AJ Epinesa, Hmm. he has had by my count three sacks and a, a one sack every single day of practice so far. Now the caveat to that is he is not going up against a padded physically, uh, a, a physical practice. And, you know, the first couple of days, the, the sacks came against like the bottom of the depth chart. But today he worked through Deion Dawkins to get back there because Von Miller wasn't, wasn't practicing today. So I just think this is a, a good sign for for them and you know to try and figure out what to do uh or or where he can go for here because he's definitely competing to be their top rotational guy he's competing with boogie basham and shaq lawson for for the top uh backup pass rusher but this is a, a really nice start for him and he's mostly winning on the outside but you know for a guy that has only and it's crazy to think this, but he has only one sack in his first two years to, for him to, you know, come into camp and, and flash every day. That, that that's a big thing for someone going into his third year. You know, I asked Brandon Bean about this the other day and I could tell like halfway through my question, as I was kind of setting it up, the response that was about to follow, um, it was a little bit of annoyance mm-hmm. I sensed from Brandon and I, and he went on to explain that annoyance that, listen, A.J. Epinesa has one of the weirder c- career arcs in the NFL in recent years because of the COVID year and what that dealt, what, what kind of blow that dealt him. So not only was he dealing with the fact that, okay, 
I'm going to have to wait until almost training camp to really get a download with my coaches like in person and get to meet the team because of, you know, COVID really canceled that off season in a lot of ways, but also he had to completely change his body. And to your point with what he's looked like this week in, in training camp, you're starting to see him feeling comfortable with the, with where he's playing at body size wise, the composition, the work that he's done. He went in the off season, he moved back in with his sister who he grew up with and who cooked for him as a kid. <laughs> and she cooked for him all off season. And he just, he felt like he was in a better place physically coming into the season and you've seen it. And today that, that play that you, you, you mentioned about working against Deion Dawkins, it's the first di- time I'll admit that I've really noticed him in the first three days, just because on the line, it's tough. I almost feel like, I don't really even really start zeroing in on that until the pads come on, but I did notice that because the the, the speed, the quickness, it, it it looks a lot like what we saw in week two against Miami last yeah. year, and I was waiting for even a, a glimmer of that at any other point last season, and it just it never really came. And but Brandon Bean seems like bully. They've lost no confidence in him, and he lost confidence last year, but they they feel like he has it back a bit. Yeah, he's. I mean, he's nothing more than a rotational guy. Don't get me wrong, but. Um, it, it is a clear opportunity to show that he is worth something to this team because this is this is it for Epinesa. He needs to prove that this year that he can be that rotational player. Otherwise, they're going to move along because Boogie Basham, you know, Shaq Loss is only signed for one year. But if AJ doesn't show things this year, they'll probably draft a defensive end at some point next year to, or at least add one in, in free agency. So this is this is an important first step for him. I want to see what he does when the pads go on because the one area that you know, in, even in one on ones today, he struggled a little bit with physicality um, against Dawkins in those one on ones. Mm-hmm. So I want to see does he have counters and is he able to win with more than just speed? It's so crazy because like he was completely the opposite player at Iowa, where he's just winning with his long arms and and pushing pushing a player into the pocket, and now he just he doesn't have the body mass to do that anymore. And he's trying to figure it out. It's like, it's like uh, you had riding a bike down Pat and then it's like, okay, now do the same stuff at a high level. Only you're on a unicycle. <laughs> like it's, it's, it's a legitimate difference mm-hmm. for, for how you have to win and how you have to operate. So I, I, I want to see what, what he does now that he's been, you know, fully, I guess, comfortable in this new body type that he has uh, and, and see if he can continue it along because it's, it's been a nice start for him. The other, the other thing that kind of stands out to me, um, and again, this is not to incite people to go, oh, he's going to be a big-time player this year. But Khalil Shakir has been nice so far. Like, and he's gotten good opportunity. You know, Some of it is not his doing. Um, because Jameson Crowder has been out the last couple of days. Uh, Jake Kumaro was out today. Those, those guys out with soreness, but it's created opportunities for him to get some more reps on the field. And even, even in his route running, I, I've noticed a, a little minor difference, a minor step up from what he was um, in the off season workouts, just like a little bit more deception. Um, seems like the steps are coming along quicker. Uh, you know, I really like, like how he sets up going into his breakdowns. Like that, these, these are things that you have to kind of come along with. And, and I think the, the coaching of, of Chad Hall and, and certainly working with guys like Gabriel Davis and Stefan Diggs has helped him in this. But yeah, he's, he's really done a nice job with things. And once again, have to do the caveat, this is fool's gold portion because it's still basically spring workouts. No pads have gone on. But I did like today that when things did get physical, and he had a contested catch opportunity against Demar Hamlin, brought it in, and even when like getting brought down with a tackle, <laughs> it wasn't a tackle, but it was a tackle all at once, and he he brought in a, a really nice pass. So I don't know what his role would be this year. I think he'll still probably be like WR five, um, and and behind Crowder and and McKenzie and and Diggs and Davis, obviously. But yeah, you know, I think he's showing them enough to say, okay, well. Let's see how much more this rookie can put on his plate. Um, I also think there's potential for him to, to play both inside and outside. Um, and I know he was kind of pegged by a lot of people like, okay, he's going to be the long-term slot option. I don't know. I don't, I don't think he's just that. I think, I think he can, he can, the way that um, he sets up his routes, I think he can work 
uh, on the outside. So it just it really depends how comfortable they're feeling with him and how much they want to put on his plate as a rookie. But I know you've liked Shakir too. I feel like he couldn't have landed in a better receiver room just because of what, what you mentioned. The ability to work with Stephon Diggs every day is going to probably unlock his route running quicker than it would have in any other spot. And I'm not saying that there's not other tactical technician type um, route runners that couldn't help him out. But I think what we've seen in training camp is a, is a real continued willingness for Diggs to kind of bring some of these young guys along. And he talked about him being, you know, a professional, I think getting a chance to work with Tavon Austin, where he's been in the league, you know, just a download with him and the juice that he brings. Um, I think it was Mc, um, McDermott that mentioned that today, but Shakir for me, if he, I kind of dropped a hot take on my podcast today and we could kind of, <laughs> you, yeah, me crazy. We can get into it a little bit if you want, but I think we're another week of camp and a, and a, and a strong preseason game away from whether healthy or not, Jamison Crowder's roster spot being at least a question, a small question that he's on the hook for $1.8 million. Right. So they're pro- pretty, much, pretty much all guaranteed. Yes. Yes. So, they're probably not going to walk away from that, right? And you're not a huge fan of the idea of Tavon Austin making the roster. Not as much as maybe I think it could be a possibility. But I don't think they take seven wide receivers into the season. And I do think that there is a situa- situation where you can cut, but I think you could cut Austin too. So that's where it doesn't kind of hold up. Mm-hmm. But I just think that if there's not availability from Jamison Crowder over the next four weeks, and that allows Shakir to play a lot and pl- give more of what he's given to this point. I don't think anybody truly offers what Crowder does because I do think that he is a, a zone beater type of slot receiver. I just don't know how much they value that after the depreciation of Cole Beasley in this offense over the last three years. Yeah. Now crap on this take. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to crap on it because uh, I don't think, I don't think it's totally far off. I, I, I I think he'll be on the roster no matter what, just because I think they value the, the veteran experience. And Tavon Austin, he's never really been an impactful offensive player. Like, it's been mostly special teams. He has big plays here or there, but nothing really substantial. And, and like, even in the the trash heap that was the, the Jaguars wide receiver room last year, like, Austin was really not making much of an impact. Like, they have LaVisca Chenault, who has been a bust, um, and Mar- Marvin Jones. Does Trevor Lawrence just stink? No, he doesn't stink. Oh. God, gosh, no. All right. Gosh, no. Give, give, give the kids some time. I okay. mean, they, they've... they oh, I mean, they had Herb last year, man. Just give, <laughs> give, 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 a, give him a minute. That's a fair, fair take. Give him a minute. So I do think that where I, where I land that maybe it's not totally off is that they take the... Um, they take the pressure off of Khalil Shakir saying, okay, we need this guy to be the fourth wide receiver this year. Mm-hmm. Like that, that shouldn't be in the equation. Like I think there is a chance we could see Shakir being an early season game day, healthy scratch and just being on that list as they kind of go forward and eventually work him in more and more. But where I tend to agree with you is that I believe based on what I have seen so far in the spring and summer, that Isaiah McKenzie is going to be the primary slot receiver. I don't, I I didn't know that I would arrive to this once, once they signed Jamison Crowder, but Isaiah McKenzie is looking smooth so far. And it's not, not just the non padded practices or anything like that. There's just something a little bit different about him, a a little bit more of an air of confidence to him in, in his route running and everything he's doing. He looks more precise he, he looks stronger on the ball. Um, it, it seems like there's a, a very natural connection between him and Josh Allen having, having uh, it, it come together. So that's why it's like, okay, I, I don't think that Jamison Crowder will get cut, but is he necessarily going to be a huge component to the offense? Probably not. Uh, well, maybe not, probably not, but I think, I think there's a better chance that McKenzie – it's a it's the Diggs Davis and McKenzie show rather than Diggs Davis M- McKenzie slash Crowder, if 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 that makes sense. No, that totally makes sense, and I think that it kind of crystallizes it a little bit more. And I think that there's even 
because of the roster numbers, I think there's a world we live in where they, they could even keep seven. And yeah. I don't think that they go that route because to your point, I think Austin with all those other small guys is is kind of repetitive. Like if they were to keep a seven, they would probably be for like somebody that does something different. Like Stevenson has some a little bit more of that deep speed, a little bit, although I don't think I'm really down on Stevenson. I don't Yeah, he's practice squad. Yeah. He's, he's practice squad material totally for me. And and so I just think it comes down to Shakir has the chance to be what Gabriel Davis was in year one. Maybe not as active, like you mentioned, like as many like game day jerseys, but they're going to give him some opportunities. The more opportunities that he makes the most of, the more he'll get along the way. And that rookie year, Gabriel Davis was huge in that indie game. Yep. And so there's there's chan- there will be chances for Shakir if he can keep making plays. Yeah, I think there's, there's a world where um, – it starts off with Shakir being the healthy and active guy. And then as the year goes on, the Jameson Crowder uh, trends into that role because Crowder doesn't give you much on special teams. Um, Shakir could help you in the return game if you really needed him to, but it's not like he's the, he's like locked in at that spot or anything like that. But Wait, are you going to, are you going to get out of here without giving your Buffalo beat crowd the low down, the lockdown on the Pontapalooza? That's where we were going next okay. actually. All right. Because All right. I, Look, I know everyone wants to know about Matareza. I know everyone knows it's kind of a bit for me, but I also genuinely love punting. <laughs> I genuinely do. And to have a punting competition between two guys with the same first name is just beautiful. So <laughs> I have adopted a nickname for one of the two contestants that uh, that I, I told our, our friend uh, Matt Perino today. And it, it goes to the guy that is not known as punt god matt hawk the the main argument for having him on the roster is because of how well he holds for field goals right so how do you how do you make this into one succinct nickname and i got it i'm a big soccer guy we we've seen a lot of like soccer names have the have the one name matt hawk from this point forward on this podcast will be holdinho (laughs) holdinho because you know, Ronaldinho, like there, there's a there's a lot of uh, the Brazilian. It's like a Brazilian uh, soccer um, sign of respect to have that one name ending in the Nho. So he's from from this point forward, Holdinho. But anyway, Holdinho saw his main job uh, get taken up by the rookie today for the first time ever. We, we saw Matareza hold some field goal attempts for Tyler Bass. I was impressed. You know, it wasn't didn't look like as natural, I'm sure, as Matt Hawk did, but he's he's only starting out. Uh, and you know, he even took a, a lower snap from Reed Ferguson and and got it to the place where it needed to go, and Tyler Bass booted it through. So that's been a, a good thing for them so far. But, you know, I think we've kind of seen a continuation from what we saw in the spring with with these punters. Um Matt Areza has a humongous leg, but it's kind of low liners where the hang time isn't there and there can be times where he just kicks it flat into the end zone or out kicks his coverage and it and gives an opportunity to the return team. Matt Hawk, not a really big leg. There's some some that he just absolutely shanks. Yeah, it's 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 a shank, but it's also one that goes way high in the air to where you're not going to get a return on it. So, like there was one situation today where they were both punting from let me go to my notes here. Oh, gosh. You could be in this room right now. <laughs> the copious amounts of notes in this book. Yeah, so it was each guy's fourth punt of the day. And they were punting from the the offense's 41-yard line. And so Matt Areza just completely threw it into the end zone. And it was like five yards deep into the end zone. The hang time wasn't great. And so obviously it comes out to the 20-yard line. Matt Hawk only kicked it 39 yards, but it hung in the air for 4.73 seconds and got a touchback out of it and landed at the 20 yard line. So it was basically an even punt. It was just two different two different streets to get there. Like it, it all depends on what the Bills want, and they probably. I mean, let's let's not beat around the bush. It's going to be Matt Arase's job unless he completely blows this thing. Um, but it Matt Hawk has done a nice enough job to make it competitive. So. You know, it's it's fun to track as we go forward between Holdinho and and Mr. Areza. Matt Matt Hawk's been the better punter 
yeah. through three days. Yeah. And so he has that going for him. The problem that I, I foresee for him to winning the job, to your point, is it's hard to erase some of the memories from last season. Yeah. And we know that they're they're punting in perfect conditions right now. So if you put them out there, even if Hawk puts out a beauty, it's hard to erase those like absolute duds in the weather. And so I, I just think it's going to be a situation where you get closer to the end and, you know, they're probably going to be, well, let's just say that they're like neck and neck. Maybe Hawk's a little bit better in game. And Ariza doesn't have any, Ariza, however you want to pronounce it, doesn't have any miscues in the holding game. I think that they probably are going to say, we drafted him in the sixth round. He's got a roster spot. Yeah, drafted him in the sixth round. Matt Hawk is replaceable. Mm-hmm. I think that that's what it would ultimately come down to. The Like I said, the only way that, that Matt Areza is not the, um, the punter this year is if Matt Hawk completely outpunts him throughout the entirety and you know it's it's going to be a bit of a learning curve because even today like the the hang times on these two guys um matt hawk his average hang time on seven punts from common situations with matt areza was 4.52 seconds and matt areza's was 4.17 and even though areza uh he averaged two more yards per punt in those situations it kind of gets evened out by the fact that the hang times weren't great and you're giving up more net yardage in that situation. But I think that's, I think, I think you just yawned and I think, I think people might be yawning about all this punt talk. Well, as soon as we got to this portion, I was kind of just going to kick my feet up on the desk and just watch the <laughs> the wizard work. And that's what I did. And you, you delivered with the, with the great pun update. So there we go. All right. Well, I think that's going to do it for, for this rendition of the Buffalo beat. Matty P, great job, dude. You crushed it. Well, I appreciate you having me on. Uh, this was a uh, a fun time whenever we get together. It's a great time. And, hey, man, we got two more weeks of this. We'll, we'll rest up and uh, the pads will be here before you know it. Ryan Talbot, my, my tag team partner, is coming up Friday, Saturday. Nice. So we're going to get nice. to jam a little well, bit. Well, speaking of Ryan Talbot, let everybody know where they can find your pod. Uh, the Shout Buffalo Football Podcast is available on all the video platforms, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, audio, Spotify, Stitcher. You all know the drill at this point. We are we, we are deep in the podcast age, so I yeah. feel like we don't even have to really mention the platforms anymore. Yeah, I, 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 I think I stopped doing that probably like two or three there years ago. Nice. With, like the tweet, I used to do the tweet with all the different links to everything. It's like, you guys, you, find you, it. You, you know. All right, so... Uh, my thanks to Matt Perino for, for jumping on the program today. And it was, uh, yeah, all the fun. Because training camp, we actually have live stuff to talk about. And I'm sure we'll have much more as we, as we go forward. So, for Matt Perino, jumping in uh, the Matt Fairburn uh, chair, this one, I, I thank him. My name is Joe Vascalia. Thanks, everyone, for listening to this episode of the Buffalo Beat. And we will talk to you next time around. See you then.